Hello, everyone joining us. Uh, I'm Rick Page. Um, let's give a minute or two for the people, or less than that, but I'm, I'm watching people walk through the virtual doorway in the Zoom auditorium for today's event. And as soon as I see the numbers stop going up as precipitously as they are, um, we'll get things going. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this special event. I'm welcoming you to our recognition of the UW, UW, UVM Medical <laughs> Alumni Association Distinguished Graduate Alumni Award recipient for 2020, Dr. Marilyn Cipolla. Today's lecture is part of the Dean's Excellence in Research Celebration, an annual two-day event that's been organized by Senior Associate Dean Gordon Jensen. I wanna thank him for putting this together. Dean Jensen will moderate the discussion after the talk. And just a brief housekeeping note, uh, we've given opportunity to ask questions via email, but for today's session, you can just go ahead and, and put in questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I'm particularly glad to welcome our graduate students and postdoctoral trainees, many of whom are presenting their work in the showcase today. If you didn't have a chance to hear the outstanding talks this morning, I encourage you to attend the afternoon session. Now we're here today to honor one of our own, a biomedical scientist who has built a distinguished career here in Vermont and who has contributed greatly to this institution while doing so. Dr. Cipolla earned her undergraduate degree in electrical engineering from UVM in 1988. She went on to earn a master's from our cell and molecular biology program in 1994, and then her PhD from the same program in 97. And in 1999, she joined our faculty. Her research currently is focused on cerebral hemodynamics and blood-brain barrier function under normal and pathological conditions, including ischemic stroke, hypertension, and eclampsia. Dr. Cipolla is on the editorial boards for several high-impact journals, including Stroke, hypertension, translational stroke research, and the Journal of Cerebral Blood Flow and Metabolism. She's published over 120 peer review manuscripts and has received continuous funding from the NIH since 1998. She's also received grants from the American Heart Association and the Preeclampsia Foundation. She's a member of the Stroke Progress Review Group of the National Institute of Neurologic Disorders and Stroke and that institute stroke planning work group and is an advisor to the, to the NINDS stroke preclinical assessment network. Dr. Cipolla is a fellow and established investigator of the American Heart Association and is past president of the Perinatal Research Society. She's also on the board of directors of the Cardiovascular Research Institute of Vermont. Dr. Cipolla has received a number of awards including the James A. Shannon Directors Award from the NIH the President's Achievement Award from the Society of Gynecologic Investigation, and the Giorgio Party Award from the Society for Reproductive Investigation. In 2015, she was named a University Scholar here at UVM, and this year, her alma mater has bestowed upon her the Distinguished Graduate Alumni Award from the UVM Medical Alumni Association. I'm so pleased and proud to welcome Dr. Cipolla as she gives the 2020 Distinguished Graduate Alumni Lecture, which she's entitled, Lessons I've Learned, How Mentoring and My Dogs Helped Shape My Career. As a dog lover myself, I'm intrigued to hear <laughs> what she has to say. Please welcome the 2020 UVM Medical Alumni Association Distinguished Graduate Alumni Awardee, Dr. Marilyn Cipolla. Welcome, Dr. Cipolla. Thank you, Dean Page, very much for that kind introduction. I wanna thank the Medical Alumni Association for this award um, and also the two people who nominated me, um, Dave Warshaw and Dave Schneider. Um, I think it's, it's always special when you get nominated for an award, but it's particularly meaningful when your colleagues that you work closely with, with do that. So I'm going to talk about the lessons I've learned. Um, I was asked to give this lecture um, about mentorship, what it meant to me, um, how it might have helped my career. 
I was also asked to gear this towards the graduate students. And so that's what I've tried to do here. And I thought what I would do is do kind of a timeline of my career and talk about the people who may have mentored me or may have had an influence on my career and talk about some science along the way. So I'm gonna start in 1989 when I first met George Osso. Now, George is now a, a retired professor emeritus um, from the OBGYN department. And George hired me as a technician when he was first starting up his lab when he was an assistant professor. Um, and George hired me um, and then I worked for him for a little while and I, he also became my thesis advisor for both my master's and my PhD thesis. Now George was or is a great scientist. Um, he really taught me the nuts and bolts of science. He taught me how to critically think, how to be thoughtful about science, how to be creative. And he also taught me how to dissect and mount cerebral vessels. And this is an image. I remember taking this image with him probably around 1990. Um, this is a cerebral artery. It's been dissected from a rat brain and it's been mounted on these glass cannulas shown here. These are the, the, the little sutures that we use to tie on the cerebral arteries. And we perfused this vessel with, with a fluorescent dye. I honestly don't remember why we did that, but it made for a really nice picture. And I use that today in, in a lot of my talks. Now, this is the chamber that we mount these blood vessels on. These are the glass cannulas I just showed you. This is the vessel. This is the optical window in the bottom of the chamber. So you can transilluminate the vessel and you can measure changes in lumen diameter. And this system was actually developed by a professor in the physiology department at the time named Bill Halpern. And Bill Halpern started a system or started a, a company called Living Systems Instrumentation that is still going strong today. It's still in Vermont. And this is the system shown here. This is, I just pulled this off the web recently. So it's a, it's a modern um, view of it. Um, and actually the, the system that I used back in 1989 looked really nothing like this. Um, there were no laptops back then. Um, that was a, a new invention. Um, this equipment, the VDA and some of the other equipment was about four or five times the size of what it is now. It took up the entire bench. Um, but it's nice to see that it's still, still going strong and that they've made a lot of progress on it. And one of the things that George was really interested in was a, 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 product, a, a process in the cerebral arteries called the myogenic response. And this is a tracing. Again, I believe I took this as well. Um, it's a tracing of, of interluminal pressure and the change in diameter in response to these changes in pressure. And you can see that when you increase interluminal pressure from 25 to 50 millimeters of mercury, the vessel dilates to the increase in pressure. But then when you increase pressure again from 50 to 75 millimeters of mercury, the vessel constricts against the pressure. And this is the development of myogenic tone. This is the myogenic response. And then once myogenic tone is instilled in the vessel, you can increase pressure further up to 100 millimeters of mercury and the diameter remains remarkably constant. And again, when you change it back down to 75, the diameter really remains remarkably constant. And George and I would have really in-depth discussions over how the blood vessel was doing this. And it was kind of an enigma of how the blood vessel is maintaining its diameter, even though pressure, interluminal pressure is going up. Because up here at 100 millimeters of mercury, wall tension, which is pressure times radius, is a lot higher than it is at 75. And yet the, the diameter is, is remaining constant. And we had discussions surrounding the smooth muscle that might be you know, uh, creating more force. There might be a latch um, state that it might be going into. And we would just have these, these nice discussions. Now, I was a cell biology student at the time. I was a graduate student. And I think all, grad, all cell biology students learn about fibroblasts. And I remember learning about a fibroblast and how they, in, in, they form actin stress fibers in response to mechanical stress. Um, and in fact, they use this to migrate, this actin polymerization to migrate to the site of a wound and actually go into the wound and, and contract and close the wound. And I had this idea. I had this idea that maybe smooth muscle might be responding to the pressure, to the mechanical force by also polymerizing actin. And so I came up with this hypothesis 
that intravascular pressure induces actin polymerization, and this contributes to the myogenic response. Now, George actually hated this hypothesis. I'm not sure why, I don't remember why, but he really didn't like it. Um, I'm not sure he, he might have not known that actin was really dynamic. At the time, I remember somebody saying that actin was just a rope for which myosin to pull on. And so he really didn't, didn't buy it, he didn't like it, but he was gracious enough to allow me to pursue it a little bit. And so what I was able to do was fix an artery, a cerebral artery pressurized. And I, was, I modified a protocol for staining for actin from cell culture to a whole artery. And then I used confocal microscopy to look at the actin stress fibers in the smooth muscle of the artery. And I won't go into all the data that, that we showed, but you know, what we were able to show was that indeed increases in intravascular pressure caused an increase in monomeric G-actin to form into filamentous F-actin. And we published this paper, um, Pressure-Induced Actin Polymerization in Vascular Smooth Muscles, a Mechanism Underlying Myogenic Behavior. We published this in, in the FACET Journal, um, which is very nice. Um, and my lesson for this <clears throat> is to be passionate and don't be afraid to follow your ideas. So in 1994, I moved to Portland, Oregon, and I worked at Oregon Health and Sciences University, and I met Wayne Clark. Now, Wayne Clark was and still is the director of the Oregon Stroke Program. And I believe Oregon, the Oregon Stroke Program was the first stroke program in the country, and Wayne is still the director there. And it was a really exciting time to be in the stroke field because of this paper that came out in 1995. This is the famous NINDS uh, uh, stroke TPA trial. And this was the, the trial that demonstrated that tissue plasminogen activator which had been used in myocardial infarction, it, it dissolves blood clots, and it had been, been used very successfully in myocardial infarction, but it was very hard to translate into stroke because it caused a lot of hemorrhage. But this trial came out in 1995 and showed that it was a positive trial and that you could indeed safely treat stroke patients with a certain concentration if patients were in a certain time window from which they had symptom onset. But after that time window, what this trial showed was that given TPA actually caused a lot of hemorrhagic transformation and could be, could be fatal. But this was a really exciting time to be in the stroke field because this was the first positive clinical trial in stroke yet. And so finally the stroke field actually had a treatment. And so it was kind of exciting. Wayne had a really nice research group and he had started, the, his research group had started using this model of ischemic stroke. And this is the model shown here. It's called the middle cerebral artery occlusion model. And this is a wrap brain. This is the base of the brain and the circle of will is shown here. This is the middle cerebral artery and another middle cerebral artery. And this green filament is actually a suture that's been coated with silicone to make it slick. And it's surgically placed into the internal carotid artery and it's advanced until it actually occludes the middle cerebral artery. And this is the model we use in our lab today. And the nice feature of this model is that you can pull the suture out at different time periods to vary the duration of ischemia and reperfusion. And so at the time, Wayne was putting in a program project grant, which is a large grant with uh, surrounding a central theme that has multiple projects to it. And I believe there were five projects in this, in this program project grant. And I went to all their meetings and I went to all the meetings and I sat there and I listened as everybody was presenting their projects and their preliminary data, which I didn't really understand very well. It was, I, as I recall, it was on neuroprotection and I, I'm a vascular biologist, so I didn't really understand neuro, neuroprotection. But I sat through these meetings and after a couple months and everybody had presented their, their projects, I realized that nobody was using the blood vessels. And so I remember raising my hand and saying, can I have the blood vessels? And they said, oh yeah, sure, we don't need them. And so what I would do is dissect out the middle cerebral artery from their animals before they did whatever experiments they were going to do on them. And I generated some data. And because they were doing the models, I didn't have a choice over what duration of ischemia and reperfusion was being done. But what they had done was they had a control, non-ischemic control. They had vessels that were occluded, but not reperfused. And then they had vessels that were occluded but then the suture was pulled out 
two hours later and allowed for restoration of blood flow and reperfusion. And I took all the middle cerebral arteries that had experienced this, I mounted them in the arteriograph and I measured the percent tone. And notice that the vessels that were occluded were about the same level of tone as the, as the non-ischemic vessels, but the ones that had undergone reperfusion actually had minimal tone. And they also didn't respond to pressure with a myogenic response. And so you can see here that when you increase pressure from 50 to 75 millimeters of mercury, this is transmural pressure, that the control vessels and the included vessels kind of constricted a little bit, whereas the reperfused vessels, the, the vessels exposed to reperfusion, dilated in response to that pressure step. And so not only did they lose their tone, they lost their myogenic response as well. Now, I showed these data to Wayne, and one of the things he said to me was, you know, it might not be reperfusion so much that is causing that loss of tone and loss of reactivity. It might just be that those vessels are 24 hours later after the ischemic insult. And I thought about that. And I actually used these data as preliminary data for my first R01. And I proposed to look at those time windows and to look at the effects of ischemia versus reperfusion on the tone and the myogenic reactivity in the blood vessels. And so my lesson to you here, well, first of all, Wayne did teach me a lot about stroke. He taught me that time is brain, that time windows for treatment matter, that you can't think about reperfusion without considering ischemia, and that TPA causes hemorrhagic transformation if given to the wrong patients. But my lesson to you here is to be a sponge. That's what I was when I first got into the stroke field. If you're interested in a field, if you're interested in a topic, go read everything there is to know about it, learn what you can about it, talk to the experts in the field and just be a sponge. It will do you well. You will know those questions that need to be asked that are important for grant applications. So in 1999, I moved back to UVM, back to Vermont and I took a, um, a faculty position in the OBGYN department, and I was a starting assistant professor. And this is where I met, um, well, I actually knew Ira prior to this, but um, here Ira is now the chair of the OB department, but he wasn't chair at the time. And he was actually putting in a large program grant called a SCORE proposal. And this is like, this they don't have these anymore, but these SCORE proposals were um, like program project grants. So there were several projects surrounding a central theme but one of the projects had to be clinical. And Ira was gonna have the clinical project and he asked me and a couple other people to have the projects and, and write the grants that would support that clinical project. Um, and so the central theme was preeclampsia. Now, I wanted to stay in the brain and the cerebral circulation. And I thought, huh, I wonder what's known about preeclampsia in the brain, preeclampsia in the cerebral circulation, or even the adaptation of pregnancy to the cerebral circulation. And I really didn't find much available. And so we actually did some experiments for preliminary data for this, for this score proposal, in which we looked, at the, we looked at the myogenic response in cerebral arteries from non-pregnant rats, normal late pregnant rats, and normal postpartum rats. And you can see here, this is the, the, the response of the diameter of those cerebral arteries to intervascular pressure. And you can see that the arteries from all groups of animals re responded nicely to, to pressure with a myogenic response. But notice that the non-pregnant vessels maintained their diameter as high as 175 millimeters of mercury. But the arteries from the late pregnant and the postpartum animals did not. And in fact, they increased their diameter and underwent what's called forced dilatation. Um, when, when pressures were increased a little you know, beyond 125 and a little beyond 150 millimeters of mercury. And the importance of this forced dilatation of these cerebral arteries is that it contributes to what's known as autoregulatory breakthrough. And I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit when I talk about autoregulation. But this was kind of an important finding. And in fact, we published this paper. This was the first paper we published on the adaptation to pregnancy um, of the cerebral circulation. Now, I was, uh, the SCORE proposal and our, our, our large program grant, it didn't get funded, um, but I was able to pull my grant out and put it in as its own grant, as its own R01, and it actually got funded. 
And that was the first grant that my lab got on looking at the, the adaptation of the shiba circulation to pregnancy. And it started a whole series of investigations, new investigations in our lab on preeclampsia and seizure. And so the lesson here is don't be afraid to enter a new field, but do your homework and contribute to new ideas and contribute new ideas. So I can't talk about influences on my career without talking about Bob Bryan. Um, Bob Bryan is um, a, a very large person in the cerebral circulation field. He's very smart. Um, he's very published and accomplished. And I put up here to the year 2000, and this might not be the year this happened, but it's how I remember it. Um, I had met Bob prior to this when um, he had visited Vermont, but I recall this instant where I saw Bob at a meeting. And right before that, I saw that Bob was using this stroke model that I had started to use. And in fact, he published a paper with his graduate student, Sean Morelli, um, looking at inner rectifier channels in the cerebral vasculature after ischemia and perfusion. So he was kind of doing the same thing I was doing. And I was kind of panicked about this because Bob was so huge in the field and there was just no way I could compete with, with someone like that. And when I saw Bob at this meeting, I think it was experimental biology. Um, I think I, he came up to me to say hello. And, and, I, and he said, I see you're using the stroke model and looking at the vasculature in response to ischemia reperfusion. And I said, yeah, and I see you are too. <laughs> and without missing a beat, Bob said to me, you know, there's room for both of us. And I remember that because it was what I needed to hear at the time. You know, I felt like I had nothing and I had sort of one idea, which was the cerebral arteries in response to ischemia and reperfusion. And yet he knew exactly what to say. And I really appreciated that. And Bob is a close colleague to this day and we're very good friends. And um, as you can see why, because he, um, he's like that. He made me feel comfortable and accepted. And so the lesson here is there is room for you in any field, but you have to find your niche. And so a few years later, um, I had the opportunity to interact with Frank Racy. Now, I didn't know Frank very well at the time. Um, and I was a little afraid of Frank because he, he was so huge in the field and he knew so much and I was just so intimidated by him. But for those of us who got to know Frank or get to know Frank and have that privilege, Frank actually has a really great sense of humor. Um, actually, the, he, sent, he made this and sent this to a few of us. This is hemodynamics for dummies. Why do you need to dilate anyways? Um, I still keep this because I think it's really funny. Um, but Frank's expertise is in cerebral blood flow autoregulation, one of his expertises is. And in case you don't know what this is, um, this is a hypothetical uh, representation graph of what happens to cerebral blood flow on the right, arterial diameter on the left, and arter in response to arterial pressure. And if you just look at the black line first, you can see that within a certain pressure range from about, 100, from about 60 to 160 millimeters of mercury, you can see that cerebral blood flow remains remarkably constant. And this is because the cerebral arteries constrict in response to the increased pressure and dilate in response to the decreased pressure. And that's that myogenic response that I showed you in the beginning. But also notice that after about 160 millimeters of mercury, there's this very large steep increase in cerebral blood flow. And this is because those arter cerebral arteries and arterioles, they force dilatate in response to that increased pressure. Now, remember this graph I showed you where the vessels from the pregnant animals and the postpartum animals underwent forced dilatation at these lower pressures. Well, because of this, we were very interested in knowing whether or not cerebral blood flow autoregulation was altered in pregnancy. And so we started working in vivo and we, start, we generated some, some data like this. This is arterial blood pressure on the bottom and cerebral blood flow on the top. And you can see that when we, we actually, we use phenylephrine to, in, to acutely increase blood pressure. And we use phenylephrine because it constricts peripherally, but it doesn't readily cross the blood brain barrier. So it doesn't really affect the cerebral blood vessels. And notice that when we increase blood pressure from about 140 
to a little over 200 millimeters of mercury, cerebral blood flow remains remarkably constant. Again, this is that autoregulation of cerebral blood flow. However, when you reach a certain pressure, there's this very large steep increase in cerebral blood flow, and this is autoregulatory breakthrough. Now, when we first started doing these experiments, these tracings look nothing like this. And in fact, what happened was when we infused the phenylephrine, we had this precipitous drop in cerebral blood flow. And we did it a few times to know it was real, but I couldn't figure out what was going on. And so I decided to email Frank Fracy, but it wasn't Frank, it was dear Dr. Fracy. This is what we're doing and I could use a little help. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. And I sent that email and within a few minutes, my phone rings and it's Frank. And he said, what's going on? And I said, oh, I don't know, you know, we're, we're infusing phenylephrine and it, it, we get this drop in cerebral blood flow. And, um, and he gave me a list of, of suggestions uh, to try, you know, one of which was where are you placing the probe? And so the next time we did it, I, I watched my technician do this and I noticed that she was gluing the flow probe, the Doppler probe onto the temporalis muscle. Now the temporalis muscle is a skeletal muscle. And of course it's constricting because the phenylephrine is constricting the skeletal muscle um, arterioles. And so we solved that problem and we actually generate some really nice data. And so these are the autoregulatory curves. This is change in rel relative cerebral blood flow. Um, the pink is the late pregnant animals and the black is the non-pregnant animals. And you can see that both groups of animals nicely autoregulate until about 175 or 80 millimeters of mercury when they undergo autoregulatory breakthrough. There's no difference in autoregulatory breakthrough and autoregulation in pregnancy, which was a really important thing to find out. However, when we took the brains out of those animals and we looked at water content as a measure of cerebral edema, what we found was that only the late pregnant animals developed edema in response to that autoregulatory breakthrough. And this was a really interesting finding, a really important finding, because it started us thinking about the blood-brain barrier and how pregnancy and preeclampsia might be affecting the blood-brain barrier in ways that, that promote edema formation. And these data actually became the preliminary data for the renewal of my first grant on pregnancy and preeclampsia. So the lesson here is don't be afraid to seek out technical help from experts. We all know it's hard. We all know that um, these are difficult things that we're doing and we're all willing to, to help. And I think it's important to share our expertise. And so I thank Frank for helping me. He's helped me much more over the years. Um, we've also become good friends and close colleagues and I really appreciate it. Now, I can't talk about influences on my career without talking about Dick Tracy. Um, I met Dick kind of late in his career, but relatively early in my career. Um, Dick passed away a few years ago. I know I'm not the only one who misses him. Um, Dick was a mentor to a lot of us in, in, this, in the stroke field, in the cerebrovascular field. Um, <clears throat> Dick was very, a very big person in the field. He was very well published and he just knew everything. Um, and I met him at a, at a scientific conference and I just pulled this from the web. I just Googled scientific conferences. So this is a random scientific conference, not one that I've attended, um, but it's very much what we, what it looks like. You know, this is the poster session. I guess it's pre COVID, none of us have masks on, um, but this is a scientific conference. And I met Dick at, at a particular conference called the Brain Meeting. Um, this is the meeting of the International Society for Cerebral Blood Flow and Metabolism um, or Brain for short, or Brain Pet. Um, in 2005, the meeting was in Amsterdam. And I actually went up and introduced myself to Dick. Now, I was very nervous doing this. Dick was a big person in the field and he was a big man too. Um, but I went up and I introduced myself and I said, hi, I, I'm Marilyn Spola, I just want to introduce myself. And, and he just stopped and he said, no, your reputation precedes you. And I didn't know what that meant. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> He said, yeah, I reviewed your first grant. Now, he probably shouldn't have said that because we're supposed to keep those things anonymous, but this was Dick and this is what he did. It was many years later. And he said, and I liked it. I said, wow. And Dick and I ended up talking that night for hours and we became very close friends and close colleagues. And for those of you who knew Dick, you, you 
know that he loved to tell stories and he had great stories. And so I could sit and listen to Dick for hours. But Dick also influenced my career in other ways. He would always go to my talks at every meeting that he was at. He would sit right in the front row. And it basically sent the message that I was important and that he was there to, to, to hear me and that I had something important to say. He also would, would check up on me on occasion. He would just randomly give me a call. How's it going? What's going on? And that was really, you know, even though he didn't necessarily direct my science, he was there for me as, as moral support more than anything. So the lesson here is don't be afraid to introduce yourself. But remember, you only have one chance to make a first impression. So I want to spend these last few minutes talking about a couple of other little guys who have had a big influence on me. The first one is Hawk. So Hawk is my 14 year old Papillon. And in case you're not familiar with the breed, a Papillon is named a Papillon because it means butterfly in French. And they're so named because of these ears. They have these ears that are the shape of a butterfly. And the white stripe on their, on their face is the body of the butterfly. And Hawk is a cutie. And Hawk was named Hawk because he actually has a, um, a marking on his back that looks like the shadow of a hawk. And the breeder named him that. And we just couldn't think of anything better. So yeah, Hawk kind of fits him. Now, Hawk absolutely loves these little tennis balls. They have little squeakers in them, little dog to toys. And he loves these things. He, this is him in the yard. He's rolling on his little ball because he loves it so much. He needs the scent all over him, you know. This is him sleeping with it. You know, he, he has to protect these balls at all costs. He absolutely loves them. This is him, his, him on our beach. We have a beach. We live on the lake. Um, this is him with it on the beach. This is him looking at it out in the water, very concerned about his little ball out in the water. What's it going to do? Is it going to come to him? Does he have to go get it? Does he have to go in the cold water? Oh, no. And he'll watch that thing for hours because he's so concerned about it. And what Hawk really loves to do is play ball. He loves to just play ball, to throw the ball, and he'll come back, and he'll do this for hours. But 14 years ago, when I first got Hawk, I didn't know how to throw a ball. And at the risk of sounding sexist, I kind of threw like a girl. And he would run and wait for the ball and look back and go, oh no, she can't throw a ball. And I decided that he was so into this ball that I had to teach myself. I had to learn how to throw a ball. And so I started practicing and I started practicing. I started practicing throwing the ball and I practiced and practiced until I actually learned how to throw a ball. And so Hawk actually was the one who taught me how to throw a ball. But the lesson here is that practice really does make perfect. Lastly, I wanna talk about Thor. Thor is my 16 year old Papillon. Now Thor has the quintessential butterfly ears and Thor, I'm a little surprised he's still with me. He has a very bad heart condition. He has a, a pretty severe mitral valve prolapse um, and a very enlarged heart. And I have to give a special shout out and thank you to Dave Schneider, who is not just a um, amazing human cardiologist, but an amazing dog cardiologist. And he has helped me manage Thor for the past few years when he's had this condition and he does go into failure on occasion. Um, but Thor's still here and, and Thor's still, he's a great dog, he's still there. And Thor's nothing like Hawk. Thor wants nothing to do with those stupid little balls, right? Thor loves to swim. He actually takes it very seriously. This is Thor asking permission to go in the water. He waits until I say it's okay, which is good. But what Thor does, instead of playing with a ball, Thor follows me around. He'll follow me around the house for hours. And all Thor wants is for me to stop and sit down on the floor so he can climb on my lap and just take a moment with him. And that's all he really wants. And so while Hawk might have taught me how to throw a ball, Thor taught me how to take a moment. And so I'm gonna leave you with the lessons that my dogs taught me, which was to take time for yourself and others, to be generous with your time, to celebrate success, and to remember to take a moment. And with that, I'll say thank you. 
I very much appreciate this award. I am very humbled by it and I really appreciate it. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. So thank you. <laughs> I guess I should stop sharing my screen. That'd be great. <laughs> there we go. So thank you, Dr. Sapola, for a uh, outstanding uh, presentation. And I want to start by reminding folks, if you want to share any questions with me for Dr. Sapola, please just type them into the uh, Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, looks like one is just, <laughs> actually, these are just favorable comments. It's starting out with wonderful talk and love the dogs. Uh, but let me throw a question your way, Marilyn. Um, you've talked a lot about uh, you know, how you learned uh, along your career trajectory and worked with wonderful mentors. Uh, I'd be curious how the pandemic uh, over the last six months has impacted your collaborations and your networking and then relate that to what recommendations you might have for um, young faculty and trainees. Uh, because things that could certainly be a lot more challenging today without the kinds of face-to-face -face encounters that you've described. Sure. You know, I think that the, the biggest impact that it has on myself and, and a lot of us is that we don't have the opportunity to go see our colleagues face-to-face, -face, go have those interactions at these scientific conferences and get that intellectual stimulation. Um, in terms of my lab itself, I have a great group and we were able, and I have to thank you, Gordon, for getting us back in the lab as quickly as possible um, and, and in a safe way. And we, we kind of, we muddled through, if you will. Um, I think in terms of, of some of the positives of it was that I was able to strengthen collaborations outside UVM because we all got used to using Zoom. And so now I'm actually putting in a grant with a colleague of mine at UCLA. And so in some ways that we were able to strengthen those collaborations because now we're all virtual and it just became obvious that we could do this. But in terms of, of you know, difficulties, I think mentoring becomes difficult. Training becomes difficult. You know, so meeting with trainees and, and mentees face to face is harder, right? It's just you're masked, it's not the same thing. Um, and I guess the advice I would give to the, the more junior people coming up is this will pass, stick with it, you know, and don't miss these opportunities, even though Zoom isn't the best um, forum, don't let, don't let this kind of bog you down. Okay, great, great response. We're getting a few more questions. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, how much of your success would you attribute to your mentors versus yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say who it came from. <laughs> right? Um, honestly, I think it's, it's, it's about a 50, 50, you know, mm -hmm. if, um, if I didn't have the help that I had and I didn't sort of have the support that I had, then I think even though I might've had ideas, moving them forward wouldn't have been the same. I mean, maybe I would have figured out to move that flow pro from the temporalis muscle eventually, but it also got me to know a, a colleague that, you know, it got me sort of knowing somebody in the field that was, that was also became a close, closer colleague and a good friend. And so, I don't know, I kind of see it as a little bit of a, of a dance, if you will, you know? Um, Yes, I had ideas, but I didn't know they were good ideas. You know, I talked to Wayne Clark and Wayne said, hey, you know, how about this? And so it's just kind of this, this symbiotic relationship, if you will. Great, very diplomatic uh, <laughs> answer there. <laughs> um, next one's interesting. I think it could also be related to the pandemic. Uh, a lot of the work you've done requires a high level of microsurgical skills. And so one of the questions is, are you still doing those yourself? Uh, and are you training you know, technicians and students to do this? And if so, how are you doing that during the pandemic? So I don't do a lot in the lab anymore. 
um, I, I'm proud to say I can still dissect and mount a blood vessel. I think that neural network was so strong that it just never went away. Um, I have really skilled people in the lab, um, many of which I've taught, but others have taught as well. Um, and so, you know, we were in a really good place when the pandemic hit because we had established people in the lab who were really good. Um, we are training a person right now. Um, and that is, I think, I, I don't know how different it, it really is because some of the, the skill that's needed is practice. So they have to just practice. Um, and then it's a matter of, of training them in the right mindset of how to deal with these blood vessels and stuff. So um, I think it's a little clunky you're training people now, but it's not, it's not terrible. Yeah, I mean, among the challenges we faced is, of course, if they're going to be in close contact during the training, full gowns, masks, the, the whole bit. So we've have had some of those yep. uh, issues uh, have come up. Uh, let's see, next question. Uh, highlights that you've, you've really reached out some to some amazing mentors and is asking if you have any specific advice for trainees as to how to find great mentors out there uh, across our campus and elsewhere. Yeah. Um, I think around campus, it would be kind of networking. So ask around, you know, ask, you could ask me, you could ask Gordon, you could ask people who've been here for a while who might know people, you know, have an idea of what you want to do, what your field might be, and then kind of talk to people. Who would be a good mentor for me? Because you, you won't know until you kind of get into it. Um, in terms of in, in the field, right now you're not gonna be able to do that. But once this pandemic passes and we can go back to going to scientific conferences, that's where you kind of, you need to network as well. You know, you need to go to those social events and those, you know, the, the, the reason they have those social events at the meetings is so you can network and you can talk to people. Um, or talk to people after their talks, you know, and, and, and really, you know, you don't want to be obnoxious, but you, you still, you have to somehow get yourself known. And so you want to introduce yourself, you know, and ask intelligent questions. Don't talk just to talk, but just ask intelligent questions. And again, I think it's about networking, you know, networking here at your home institution to find those good mentors. And then networking out there, it's a little harder out there, I think, you know, in, in the scientific community. Um, but that's where, you know, you have to be a little bit brave and go and introduce yourself. And if they don't want to talk to you, you don't want them as a mentor anyways. So. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Um, let, let me throw a scientific question your way, because I know you didn't really have an opportunity to talk about this uh, in your presentation. Might you tell us a little bit about the current understanding of uh, molecular mediators of uh, ischemia reperfusion injury? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure. So, so a couple of things that we're looking at are, um, one of which is oxidative stress, and in particular, peroxynitrate. Um, one of the things that we found was that I showed you the data where the middle cerebral artery undergoes like progressive vasodilation as the ischemic and, and reperfusion duration go up, go increase. But the penetrators in the brain, the parenchymal arterioles, actually vasoconstrict. And that was something that, that we found that was a few years ago. And what we found was that it was, that vasoconstriction was due to smooth muscle calcium sensitization. And that led us to thinking about rokinase, and peroxynitrate activation of rokinase. And so that's one of the mechanisms we're looking at for that. Um, in terms of the, um, the vasodilation and, the, and, and of the middle cerebral artery, I think that's a lot of oxidative stress. Um, it's probably superoxide and peroxynitrate um, that's causing that, that, what we call vascular paralysis. Um, we looked at the actin cytoskeleton and sure enough, it showed that it decreased as that tone decreased with the ischemic and reperfusion duration increasing. So, so that's some of the stuff we're looking at. Great, well, thank you. Um, well, not seeing any more questions from anyone. What I'd like to do is on behalf of uh, our college and the University of Vermont, uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Sapola on her award and recognition and the fantastic uh, presentation. So thank you so much. Thank you.
And uh, let me wrap up by inviting everyone who's uh, on our program here to please tune in tomorrow afternoon between four and six o'clock. Again, it's a virtual conference, but we'll be doing the State of the College Address. We'll be doing the Research Celebration Awards, and we'll wrap up with a fantastic uh, keynote uh, address from Mark Nelson. So. Thank you so much and everybody have a great day and also tune in to the uh, uh, graduate student showcase uh, later this afternoon. Great. Take care, everybody. Thank you.